Great. It looks like we have quite a bit of um, range in your experience with hypothesis, so that's great. I will be sure to give you all then uh, an introduction for those of you that are new. I'll review what it looks like to add a hypothesis to a course reading in Blackboard, and then we will spend uh, primarily uh, the rest of the time talking about groups and how to use hypothesis with groups. Um, we um, we did just roll out, I want to say end of December, early January. Um, my dates might be off on that, so don't quote me on that. Uh, the end of 2021 and the start of 2022 were quite a blur, as I'm sure they, they were for you all. Um, we rolled out uh, the feature uh, to use Hypothesis with Blackboard groups. So it's one we're particularly excited about. So for those of you that have used Hypothesis before, uh, it sounds like it may be brand new to you. Um, also, just keep in the back of your head as you know you see and review the tool today as we talk about groups. I always encourage you to think about ways in which this might work for you and your students and to not hold back in sharing those ideas. I imagine, although you are all coming from uh, various uh, disciplines today, that any ideas you have may also be beneficial for your colleagues in today's session to hear, uh, as well as for those of you in uh, at the Cal team to kind of keep in your, your back pocket or your toolkit as you're working with faculty and supporting them too. Um, so yeah, feel free, ideas, uh, throw them out if and when they come up, questions, uh, throw, those, throw, those, throw those out as well, um, and I'll keep things rolling and um, to, to seeing um, how we all feel at the end of today's session today. Uh, so I will just start by reviewing some of the goals for using hypothesis. These may not be new to a lot of you, um, but I find they're always worth mentioning. Um, the idea that hypothesis is a great tool for helping make readings more active, more visible, and more social. Uh, active in that your students are actively engaging in annotation while they're reading. Um, so applying some of those close reading skills, uh, any strategies or protocols that you have students do while they're reading, they have a place to do those with social annotation. Uh, hypothesis is a great place or a great way to make students thinking visible, uh, visible to you, the instructor, visible to themselves, as well as to their peers. Uh, there's a quote I often share in other sessions uh, um, from, I believe, Linda Parsons is her name from Ohio State, and she talks about how uh, hypothesis gives her uh, a window into students' thoughts and understandings that you she otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, so annotations can be really valuable, uh, not only to students themselves uh, for their own thinking, but for you, the instructor, to give um, you that concept, context and insight. I just combined those two words. Apologies for that. Uh, and then the part that's particularly near and dear to our hearts is that hypothesis is a social annotation tool. So those conversations that your students are having, that you're having with them, um, it really does create this collaborative learning environment uh, for you and in, in your course. And I did realize I shared the slide deck a little bit earlier prior to some of you joining. And I know you can't always see what's in the chat prior to joining a session. So let me just put that slide deck in there again before I forget. And I'll just talk about some other goals for using social annotation. Um, Hypothesis and social annotation can be a great way to focus on student-centered learning. So learning something, putting that responsibility on them um, and hopefully allows you as the instructor to spend less time explicitly telling students what to do and spend more time asking them questions, provoke their thinking, motivate them to ask their own questions. Uh, we hear more and more about how readings can really be a community building experience. Those conversations that you and your students are having around a shared critical reading of text really gives, um, creates the sense of a social and emotional community and not just an academic one. Um, hypothesis can be great for enabling student learning in a variety of environments. So whether you're uh, teaching online, in person, hybrid, small group, large classes, small classes, there's lots of options for you uh, to make social annotation valuable for you and your students learning. Um, and then just coming back to the idea again that making thinking visible to others hopefully leads to more potential change in learning, that thinking together leads to cognition across the context. 
uh, this next slide here has uh, several different resources for you. Uh, you're, I've shared the slide deck. These are all linked in there for you to come back to. Some may be new to you, some may be not, but I'll just go over a few of them that I think are, are, are quite valuable. Uh, the first one is a great uh, guide for students, tips for students on how to annotate. Uh, the second one um, walks um, you through the different types of annotations. Uh, so what is the initial annotation, what's for apply, page notes, and so on. So it digs into the different features of, of annotations. Uh, multimedia can be a great way to uh, have your students uh, give them choice in how they're responding to the text. So they could, instead of maybe responding with text, they could add an image to make a connection. They can link out to an external video or another article. Uh, in their annotations. Uh, so this third guide here walks you through how to add multimedia to your annotations. Uh, we are slowly but surely collating resources from our uh, partners, so all of our partner institutions. So if you ever have any ideas to share or, or we will that you're willing to share out with others, um, we will happily accept those so that you will find in the partner created resources a uh, both annotation assignment ideas, as well as like how to tutorials and so on, uh, as well as um, some other articles that uh, partners of ours have have written on uh, on social annotation and how it's worked and looked at their uh, institution. Uh, and then the last one here is examples of classroom use. Uh, I do always like to point out that that those examples do come from our public app. So it may look slightly different. That is the only way we're able to show them to you. As you can imagine, we can't take anything that's inside of a school's LMS and share it publicly. Uh, so this gives you an example of ways it's been used uh, in classrooms, but it, it does use our public app to do that. Um, let's talk specifically, I'll just recap this in Blackboard. Um, so uh, the great thing about Hypothesis, in, or one of the many great things about Hypothesis in Blackboard is all you as an instructor have to do is create a Blackboard or a Hypothesis enabled reading in your course. Uh, you don't have to create accounts for students. Students don't have to create accounts for themselves. They're automatically annotating based on the course that they're in. And now with the Blackboard groups integration, they also have the ability to annotate in those smaller groups within their course. Um, and then another great feature of using Hypothesis in Blackboard is if you choose to, you can assess students' annotations. Uh, so you can grade their annotations. Uh, I find that uh, the grading toolbar can be also just handy for getting a quick snapshot of individual students' work. So you'll see here from the dropdown, I could select an individual student and I would just see their annotations. So even if you're not assigning any sort of points, you don't want this in the gradebook, you can just get a quick snapshot of what each student is doing and how they've participated in the reading. I'm gonna pause there because I know we have um, several of you that are new um, and several of you that have used Hypothesis before. Uh, I'd be curious, um, Tier, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, if anyone would like to share um, how they're using it or how they have used it, um, because I imagine some of your colleagues would be curious to know what that's looked like for you so far. And you're welcome to put that in the chat if you have anything to share or you can verbally share as well. Awesome. Thank you, David. I, I often recommend in the schools that I work with that uh, professional development for faculty and training for faculty can be a great first step in getting comfortable with a tool. 
Um, so hypothesis is, is great um, for those sorts of scenarios when maybe you're not having to do it in front of your students, but you're getting to you're seeing how you might experience it with with your students if you were to uh, transition that into your into your own course. Um, I find it's less intimidating that way than to have to do it. it can be less intimidating in front of your colleagues than once you're trying to introduce it to your students. So that's a great first step. If some of you have been fortunate enough to use it in that uh, training. Uh, well, if any ideas, if anyone has any um, to share, feel free to keep those coming. Um, I did just want to touch on uh, two things that are frequently top of mind for those of you that are new to Hypothesis, and that is what can you annotate and what can you include in your annotations. Uh, and that is uh, you can annotate with Hypothesis any publicly available websites or PDFs. Publicly available does mean that it can't be hidden behind a set of credentials or a paywall. So if you're anything like me and get those notifications that you've used up your free articles for the month uh, on the Wall Street Journal, or New York Times, or whatever it is, that is an example of a resource uh, that you can't use with Hypothesis. You could take any of those sorts of resources and turn them into a PDF, but you do want to make sure you're abiding by any copyright policies at UDC. So I don't want to quote you on what falls into fair use, as every institution does something a little bit differently. Uh, and then I do like to always talk about OER text or open education resources. Uh, these work very well with Hypothesis because as they're stated, they're open. So they don't reset, require a set of credentials or a login. Um, uh, I worked with a faculty member at another school last week and he was using OpenStax. Uh, so I walked him through setting up uh, his OER textbook uh, with, uh, from OpenStax. Worked great. Um, so that's always an option and we're just hearing more and more about institutions using those uh, OER texts. And then in terms of what can you put in an annotation, uh, as you might expect, most commonly, students and instructors are responding to uh, text with text. Uh, so their annotations contain text. But you also have the option to incorporate multimedia into your annotations. Uh, so you can uh, have students link out to external sources or add images or videos that relate to the text. Um, you can add tags to your annotations in a way, as a way to categorize or organize annotations. Um, you can make it a little fun and use emojis, uh, as well as um, uh, equations. Um, if uh, we have a LaTeX uh, equation builder that you can use as well, if that would fit with anyone's discipline. Uh, and yeah, great question. Uh, so loading the OER, you would just get the shareable, the link. So whatever link you would use um, to share the OER text with students, uh, it does, since most OER texts are publicly available, you would just get that publicly available URL. And when you create your hypothesis enabled reading, that's the URL you will enter. Uh, since I do have a few of you that are new today, I did want to go ahead and demo what it looks like to create a hypothesis enabled reading. Uh, so I will walk you through that now. Give me one second. Of course, I'll set up here. Different link here.
one here. Apologies for that. All right. So what I wanted to go ahead and do, um, like I said, is show you what it looks like to create a hypothesis enabled reading. I'll start by not using groups. Um, and the reason for that is some of you are brand new, and I just want to make sure you know how to just get started if you want your entire course to annotate. Uh, then I will walk through what it looks like to do it with group sets. So I'm going to go ahead here and build content. From build content, I will select hypothesis. And the first thing I'm going to do is name my reading. I have an article pulled up, so I'm going to just go ahead and use that one today. And in terms of the description, that can be a great place for you to put what students are doing while they're reading. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and paste some simple instructions for us there today. So I've named my reading. I've put in a description of what I want students to do. Uh, obviously, those are both up to you to customize. You can leave the description link if you choose to, like you would with any other content in Blackboard. I can choose to enable evaluation. So if I select yes, it's going to ask how many points I want to add up. So I'll go ahead and select 10. I'm going to go ahead and select submit. Now you'll see what I haven't done yet is add in my reading. I haven't said where my reading is coming from. So what I need to do is I need to click the link here. And it's going to ask where my reading is coming from. So I can enter the URL of a publicly available web page or PDF. That's what you would select if you are doing OER text, because that's a publicly available website. Um, I can select a PDF from Blackboard, Google Drive, or OneDrive. Um, because this is our test environment internally, you do see VitalSource here. If any of you are using VitalSource textbooks, please don't hesitate to reach out. We are always looking. Uh, for users to test this new integration for us. So if you fall into that category of a vital source user, your e-textbooks are available through vital source, um, please reach out and we can we can have you test that if that's something you're interested. Uh, but on your side, you won't see that vital source option. So if you're if you're at a launch, you won't see that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and enter the URL of a web page. So I'm gonna paste that here. and hit submit. Um, I will come back to this. This is where you would select if this is a group assignment. So if you wanted to create a group assignment, uh, you could go ahead and you would select this. Um, but you do have to create your group sets first, which is why I'll come back to that. So I'm going to leave that toggled off. And here you have my hypothesis enabled reading. So on the left hand side, I have seven ways to retain more of every book you read. That's the blog I'm using to annotate today. And on the right hand side, I have the hypothesis annotation sidebar. Any questions about just the setting up steps? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bounce back into my slide deck uh, for a second. And just talk about groups. So before I walk through uh, what it looks like to create a group set, I did want to talk about um, why you might want to use groups uh, for your hypothesis enabled readings. Uh, there are obviously some benefits for whole class annotations. Um, and I frequently do get asked, like, sort of, what's the ideal group size? What's the ideal, um, you know, reading size to use small groups? I really think that depends on the intent of how you're using hypothesis, what you're having students do in their reading. Um, uh, but 
there's, you know, there's benefits to both sides. Um, so like I said, some benefits for using whole class annotations is that students are learning from a wide variety and diversity ideas. So rather than building a community and hearing just from their small group, they're able to hear the ideas, the thoughts, the questions of the entire course. So it doesn't sort of limit um, the conversation to a smaller group. Um, like I said, great place, you know, build community uh, for the entire course to build that community rather than a smaller group building community. Uh, and then another benefit is for you, the instructor. Um, so when you're annotating as a whole class, you're able to annotate, ask questions, add those helpful hints, guiding questions uh, that the entire class will see. So that can be a benefit. Uh, there can be some benefits to using small group annotations. Um, so you can give small groups a specific task in annotations. Um, students may feel naturally just more comfortable starting off by annotating with a smaller group, where rather than the entire course seeing their annotations, it's just a small group uh, that maybe they've already become comfortable with. Um, and then there's lots of different ways you can you can work with those small group discussions. Um, so a small group can aggregate the annotations, present those to the rest of the class, almost in like a a jigsaw. So maybe groups become experts on certain sections of the text or different texts. Um, and then they present that or share that out, share their, their expertise to the class. Um, so almost turning them into um, the instructors. Uh, so with that being said, um, while we do have uh, Blackboard groups integration, so you can use Blackboard group sets, uh, there are a couple other options that I still like to bring up when talking about groups. Um, so know that you know you do have the option to break students into Blackboard groups, assign your course rating to that group set, um, and then they'll automatically just be annotating based on the students in their group. Uh, but there's a couple other options, uh, like I said, that I like to bring up because there are some benefits to doing them the other way, depending on what works for you and your students and what your intention is. Um, so you could assign all students um, uh, roles in the groups. Um, so rather than um, having students annotate, different groups annotate different versions of the document, you could have all the entire course annotate uh, a single document together, a single reading, um, but they have different roles. Maybe they're physically sitting together and annotating and they're sitting in their groups and maybe one student is the writer of that group and they're the one creating the annotations. They're tagging their annotations with their group number and name, um, but they have different roles or different tasks. Um, so here's just some different ways that you can break students up. You could have one student, one group be the question askers. One group is maybe responsible for going back in and trying to answer those questions. Uh, you could break students up so that students annotate different sets of pages as well. Um, and then you could also do sort of a more traditional jigsaw method where different groups annotate different readings. Uh, so that you would set up as if you were just setting up any other hypothesis reading. If you had students annotating five documents, uh, you would have to uh, create those hypothesis enabled readings. Um, each of those, you'd have five readings. Uh, the third, the second option before we get to Blackboard groups that you still have the option to do um, is to create unique fingerprints for each group. Uh, so some of you that have used Hypothesis before may be familiar with this method. Um, I would say that the, the time is really just the, the downside of this method. Um, uh, so if you want students to annotate, and the, the benefit I see of using this method and not Blackboard groups is one comes to mind, you may have some others, is if you still want students to be able to go back and see the other group's annotations, this may be your route to go. Um, so students can't be in multiple, in a group set, students can't be in multiple groups. So if you go the Blackboard groups route, students will only ever be able to see the annotations of the group that they're in. If you decide to go the unique fingerprint route, um, what you could do is you cre could create five uh, versions with a unique fingerprint on each of them for that, say, the PDF that you're using. Um, tell, okay, group one, you're accessing this version, group two, you're accessing this version, and so on for your five groups. 
students annotate just in the document you told them to, right? So group one is only really looking at group one's version of the PDF, but perhaps at the end or your next step in the learning process is for students to all go back and see the other group's annotations. So that's primarily why I still like to bring up this option. Um, there's a little bit of uh, logistics that are required to set this up. You do have to create a separate PDF file um, for each of the groups. It's, we have a tool that'll do it for you. It's pretty easy um, to use. And then you would go in and create your hypothesis enabled readings, um, one for each group. So um, I do always, you know, I know it's, 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 a, it's a workaround, if you will, but I still like to bring it up because I can see some benefits for why you might want to use it. So this is potentially what it could look like. We have your groups. If I had four groups, um, everyone would see the other um, assignments, but you would only go into the group that you were a part of. And then at the end, you could maybe have the next step for students be to go back and read the other group's annotations, maybe participate and join their conversation. So they're getting the perspective first of their small group, then they're broadening um, their conversation to the entire course. And then the last option, uh, I would say is the, the most seamless option, if you will, and that's to use Blackboard uh, with small groups um, or Blackboard groups um, for creating your hypothesis enabled readings. Uh, so what I want to do is jump back into my course here. I'm going to close out of this reading. And I'm going to walk you through what it looks like to create a hypothesis uh, reading with group sets. So what you will do is you will create um, and I'm realizing now that the course I am showing you is Blackboard Original Learn and not Ultra. So let me actually jump into an Ultra course because you all use Ultra, correct, David? Yeah, that's correct. So Blackboard Ultra. Perfect. Perfect. Let me. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so um, I'm in a course here that is Ultra, so this should be what you all are more familiar with. And what I will go is um, I'll select view sets and groups. So I don't have any group sets in here yet. Um, so I'll go ahead and select new group set. Oh, I do have reading groups, my apologies. And what I'm going to do is create my, um, Group. So I can choose to customize, I can randomly assign, or I can self-enroll. Um, so I'll just go ahead and custom make my groups here. And I only have four, um, four students in here. Um, so what I can go ahead and do is create my group. And I'm gonna, I'll just leave them, keep them simple. I'm gonna, oops. Add to new group one. I'm going to add Professor Dean here to new group one. And then I'm going to create another group. We'll just call that new group two. I'm going to add class clown to new group two and all student to new group two. So I just have here my two groups in my group set. And then I will save. I'd be curious, are, are, are people, um, feel free to throw it in the chat, are you all using a lot of Blackboard groups with a lot of your assignments? Are you, and take Hypothesis out of the picture, are you all pretty comfortable using, um, using Blackboard group sets? Is it fairly new to you? You haven't really explored it much yet. You're using it a lot. Um, does anyone have any, any context to share? I'd be curious to see how comfortable you are with just creating um, group sets. So Becky, I can you hear me? I'm just yeah, I can sure. hear you. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I have used group sets before. 
Um, and they're, it's pretty straightforward. Um, one of the things that I wanna in, invite instructors to do, just because um, it's become helpful for me and I keep forgetting to tell myself this, is that to assign your fake student ID, the instructor's fake student ID into each group as well. So then when you look at um, the course in student setting, you can see that, you know, your group, who's in your group. So then you can explain to students how to see that too, because from the back end, it doesn't really, it's not very clear or intuitive what it looks like. And the only way to really see how that is more intuitive is to put yourself as your fake kind of like mirror student version of yourself into that group. So I just want to encourage people to think about doing that because it, it makes it a little bit easier to, to walk um, students through if they're having difficulty. Yeah, thank you so much for that helpful hint. That's one I wouldn't have um, wouldn't have thought of. <laughs> um, so that's that's uh, that's great. Thank you for that. And just to say, make sure you put yourself in every single group too, because you can do that. You can put your mirror version of yourself into each group. because so you will only see, if you're only in one group, you only see that group's version. So just the tip for those of you who are experimenting with group settings. Yeah, I will say a benefit, um, just for some context for those of you that are new um, to using hypothesis, um, is that once you're in a hypothesis enabled reading, creating the hypothesis, annotations, creating, um, annotating the document, that experience is exactly the same. How to create annotations, how to interact with the text, how to have conversations in the sidebar, that experience is exactly the same regardless of your role. So for students and instructors, creating annotations is the same. So that's always um, helpful to know. Um, but when you are, when you do create a group set from the instructor side, you do see every group. Um, but Jasmine's point is really um, a great tip um, to review. You can put your, it's the your name underscore, thank you David for that, preview user into each group so that you can um, you can see it from the student perspective and all of that for them. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so I've created my group set. What I'm going to go ahead and do here is close out of there. And I'm going to go back here and I'm going to add course content. I'm going to create. Yeah, Becky, for us, it would be under a content market or books and tools, and then adding the hypothesis link that way. Yeah. So I guess that's where it's slightly different. So I don't know if on our side than on y'all's, would it be useful, David, at this point to, for me to, um, to use your environment to share what it looks like and we can create a, a group set there? Or I can show everyone here how to add that on in the content for uh, Blackboard Ultra. <laughs> then you can continue it on your end for the group side. Does that work? Perfect. Sounds, yeah, okay. sounds good. Excellent. So I'll share my screen for everyone here. And just a quick review, uh, when you are adding the hypothesis content in Blackboard Ultra, like you see right here on mine, you can click on the plus sign, go to content market. If you scroll down, you'll see hypothesis right here. Um, if you want to add that hypothesis content directly, click on the plus sign. And what it does, let me delete this old one. But what it does right here is it adds that hypothesis link. If I click on it, like Becky went over before, you can add a PDF, the website link. We do recommend using OneDrive since we are that Microsoft 365 campus. I'll go ahead and close it for you. And what she did recommend earlier is if I click on the three dots and edit, I'm able to put the description and rename the title. So for example, hypothesis article, click here. Uh, this is the reading for chapter four. All right, so I could do something like that, make it visible to students, save, and that's how it goes from there. Right? Any questions about this part from 
many participants here. And David, could you just quickly go back to the, uh, the edit function so you can show people how to turn into a grade book? Yes, thank you. So yeah, right here, uh, there's a create grade book entry for this item. If I click on that, you can change the due date, grade using points or percentage or letter. You can also put it in the category right there and then save. Thank you, thank Jasmine. You. Great reminder. Uh, Becky, I think uh, anything else I should show? No, I think, I think you covered it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And I will go ahead and share my screen again here. So let's go ahead. We'll be the UDC group. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. Um, so I followed the steps uh, that David showed. Um, what I want to do, though, is I want to go ahead and select where my reading is coming from and make sure I select that it's a group assignment. Oops, that one's already created, apologies. Let's add a new one here. Uh, let's pull up another article that I can use as my demo. And then submit. So you do have to add the reading first, then tell us or tell Blackboard uh, that it is a group assignment. So I would select this is a group assignment and it's going to ask which groups that I want to assign it to. Um, so the new group set is the one I created today. So I'll go ahead and select that one and then continue. And um, I am enrolled in this course. Uh, so, you know, I'm from the instructor perspective. So as an instructor, I can see here um, both groups. So I could select click over to new group. Maybe I want to tell group one directions. Group one, do this today in the reading and post. And maybe group two, I want to tell them something different. I have uh, group two doing, working on a different task. So I'm going to toggle over and what advice would you give or something like that? and post. Um, so would group two, if a student is enrolled in group two, they would only see the annotations for group two, including just the annotations, just my instructor annotations, uh, and group one would only see uh, group one's annotations. Uh, David. Yeah, quick question, Becky. So let's say I added page notes to these uh, directives. Do I have to do that for each group? Okay. You would. Yeah, so that is something to keep in mind if you, um, depending on how you use Hypothesis, if you're using it um, to, you know, put guiding questions throughout or, you know, helpful hints or those page notes that maybe have the directions, you do have to add it to each group. Hopefully that would just be a, if it's the same directions or the same page note, you could, it could be a quick copy and paste. Yeah. Um, that is definitely, um, I also, that's, that's product feedback we've gotten that it, you know, obviously would be, be ideal from an instructor perspective. Um, so I will keep keep pushing that one <laughs> along to our product team. Um, just making a note of it on my side. Um, Perfect. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions about using it with groups? Uh, to go back to sort of an earlier question that just come up a lot um, in terms of how many students in each group, I think it really does depend on the length of the reading as well. Um, so something to keep in mind, as you can imagine, if you were having your students annotate a sh short poem and you have 20 students, 
20 students is, is, is potentially not that large of a class, but when you have 20 students annotating a short poem, having to navigate through all of those can be quite challenging um, and a little overwhelming for both students and instructors. So maybe that would be a scenario where you wanna put students in smaller groups. Uh, for some of those longer readings, maybe it makes sense to keep them you know, in either bigger group, set, group sets that have um, larger numbers in each group, or maybe at that point, it makes sense to do a entire course reading and all students are annotating the course reading together. So up to you. Um, something I do wanna mention that hasn't been um, brought up before is you could choose to, so obviously hypothesis is a social annotation. Um, uh, tool, um, but you could remove the social aspect of it um, with Blackboard group sets. So if you chose to, you could create a Blackboard group set that each group has just one student in it. So it would really be you and the student in that group. Um, so if you did want to more, do more of an individual assessment or wanted to see, um, uh, make it truly an independent work, um, but you still wanted to see students' annotations, um, we could create a group set that contains one student per group. So um, remove that social aspect if that's something that um, would be of interest to you. Um, so now that we've talked about groups, I'm going to throw the, the baton back to you all and see if anyone has any ideas of how you might use small groups for your course readings, uh, what that might look like for you, um, when you might choose to use groups versus maybe a, a large, um, annotate a large uh, reading together. Uh, Jasmine, hand up. So I tend to use hypothesis a lot for um, keyword locations, right? Like, so I put a set of vocabulary terms and I want students to, to find and define, define and like explain um, the usefulness of the term, like the meaning and the significance for the author. One of the things I keep not using groups because like the classes are small, so I don't see like the, the usefulness of it. But what could be interesting, as you said, like those one person ones, um, I could make it for each individual person just to find the one, like I assign a term to each student or a group of, or a, a collection of students. I guess the thing that concerns me in the end of that is that I want all of the students to be seeing all of the annotations. So in the end, they can't really see all of them. Or is there a way that you can make them be able to see all of them? Not yet, I don't think. Um, it would just be their groups that can only see those annotations. Yeah, not yet. And I will, um, I'm gonna make a note about product feedback for that one as well. There isn't yet a way to open up those small group readings to then make it visible to the entire course. That could potentially be a scenario where you wanna go the route of using PDFs and unique fingerprints for those PDFs. Uh, students would still then have to go back in and look at multiple readings to see what other groups did, but maybe that's okay because they're seeing the reading multiple times. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, that would be one option. And one of the things is, is like maybe um, if you have a unit where it's thematic and then at the end they have to go back and review those readings anyway um, for an exam or something, they can see their peers um, uh, kind of feedback on that. Um, I think that sometimes that might make it more uh, and easier for an instructor to also then give feedback in the actual annotations in a way that doesn't feel so traumatic maybe for the students because then not everybody's seeing it at the same time. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking through that process. I like the fact that the, the, the software is morphing uh, in a lot of ways. So thank you so much for, yeah. for thinking through that. And Becky, I'm thinking about for my own use cases, since I train faculty, uh, for example, with the high flex mode of teaching, we have training for that in Blackboard. So having maybe groups, but it's a one person group, um, I can really check for comprehension from each professor, answer their questions directly, just like what Professor Yarish Jasmine said, um, just so they're not afraid. <laughs> so I can really work with them directly. I really, I haven't thought about doing that with groups. Uh, just like a one person group. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us today.
It's sort of a funny right. one because it goes against like what the tool is designed yeah. for, but like, why not, right? Like, yeah. That's like a perfect Why not be usage. flexible? Yeah. yeah. And I think Helene also had her hand raised or- uh, Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, uh, yeah sorry, uh, hold on a sec. My question actually is, um, how, how, for those of you who've used it with classes, with students, um, how easy is it for students to use? I mean, I'm, I'm getting ready to use it with my class and I'm a little nervous about, you know, how the students react to it. Do all the students participate? Do, you know, how much training we have to give them ahead of time? Um, so anybody who's used it, um, Craig or Jasmine, any of you who've used it, what's been your experience? I've um, used it with small yeah. class, with uh, with whole classes uh, before. Uh, the only uh, the only problem that I've uh, had is that uh, with larger classes, they are everything that can be said about the reading uh, has been said. So uh, it's hard for some people to to write without being repetitious. So that's why I'm here to learn about using it in small groups. So this way, uh, this way, everyone uh, feels like they're uh, you know they're contributing and has uh, agency to give their own individual feedback. Yeah, I would echo what, what Craig said. I think the, the, I don't have a lot of students. Um, and one of the things about giving feedback to them in, in some in the classes that I've used that I've had, I mean, upwards of 20 maybe, but then that determines how many um, concepts I give them, right? If I'm doing it as a, as a way to capture conceptual readings, right? Like specific terms or specific ideas for specific authors. Um, I will curtail the list. Um, I will make it longer, I'll make it shorter, um, depending on what's needed. And I do evaluate students on whether or not they um, collectively answer all of them, <laughs> if that makes a lot of sense. So um, two people can give definitions and meaning for one, uh, for one concept, but if it goes to like three or four, those the thir three, third and fourth person um, who hasn't been evaluating their other peers and they're just saying, yes, that's what I thought it was. And they haven't gone on to do one of the other active, uh, the other options. Um, they'll have a reduced score, but they usually know that in advance from me because the whole point is to pay attention to what the peers are saying and to imp like thinking about stepping up and stepping back and what can you add as opposed to what you're just, um, you know, jumping on the bandwagon kind of stuff. So if you put that in the directions and the students make it clear that that seems to cut down on some of the things that Craig was saying, at least from my experience. Just to add, I know that uh, Jasmine shared this earlier with us. Uh, she adds the directives in the page notes section under that tab. So the students can see those directions. Um, Helene, I also recommend if you are starting to use hypothesis, hypothesis in your class, I think Becky shared this with me before, is I start with putting guiding questions as the instructor. So I start annotating the text first, because sometimes if you're the first student to annotate, you're kind of apprehensive. So I put like three or four guiding questions throughout the text that I made or added as annotations just to get them started with adding their own thoughts and annotations. Well, yeah, I mean, we had that experience in the high flex course, yeah. which was really valuable. So that was great. Thanks. Thank you, Helene. <clears throat> also, one more thing, Helene, to add, to add is, um, in our by very first week, I make sure that I do two activities where we do it in class. So we have two readings where we all do it collectively together. And that's when I do what David suggested, like adding my own annotations to it um, and uh, kind of guiding them through that process. And sometimes that helps a lot because if you model it for them, right, as you know, from the high flex class, like if we model it for them, then they kind of get the idea moving forward. And I think just, I, I know I'm not using it with students, but I, I teach many on how to use the tool. I, I do hear from faculty that it is pretty just across the board intuitive for students to figure out, but I think everyone's, um, you know, just the logistics of how to create an annotation, um, but everyone um, uh, points definitely were, were super helpful on, on how to make it more comfortable for students and more likely to get them to interact and, and have them to participate. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, and yeah, that's a, um, 
uh, a very common one, a popular one that we hear about um, is having students annotate the syllabus um, as a way to, to engage students in using a tool on a, on a lower state, in a lower stakes assignment or, or reading. Um, so yeah, thank you for that reminder, David. Any other ideas, questions? I know we're, we're coming up on time and I wanna be respectful of you all and all your, um, your busy schedules. Do anyone have any uh, questions or, or comments, ideas to share? I also, just because we talked about the syllabus, I've recommended um, the conference points activity. It's, it's one of Harvard Project Zero's visible thinking routines, which are typically geared more to the K-12 space, um, but compass points can be a good uh, protocol to use with your students on the syllabus. So I just put a link to that in the chat if you wanna take a look at it. It's pretty simple, but it works well with the syllabus. Um, so I didn't see any hands up. Um, if I missed it, please, please interrupt, or if you have anything um, to share, please interrupt me. But I did just wanna wrap up and talk about, um, you know, next steps, if you run into any technical issues, something's not functioning as expected, fingers crossed that will never be the case. Um, but if you do, you can always link out to our, check out our knowledge base articles and reach out directly to our support team. Please, please don't hesitate to do so. Um, I would hate for something, you know, you're confused by something or something's like, you're like, I thought this works like this or like this, and it's not. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, our, um, hopefully anyone that's ever worked with our support engineers has very positive things to say about them. Internally, I have positive things to say about them. Um, they're very quick to respond and can help and always happy to jump on a, a screen share. Uh, you're also welcome to reach out to me with any questions on implementation and videos for use as well. Um, and that's sort of where my next slide comes in, in terms of implementation and pedagogical support. We have some guides for using hypothesis. Uh, our team's always happy to meet one-on-one, -on -one, whether that's with you or with a colleague. Feel free um, to share any of these resources with any of your teammates that might be interested in learning more. Uh, I recommend checking out our Liquid Margins show. We have one coming up on March 4th. I believe that's next Friday. Um, uh, it's a podcast style video show where our team virtually sits down with faculty and educators across, really across the world using Hypothesis, uh, but primarily in North America. Um, and uh, you can find different ideas from past episodes from ways that it's been used in courses. Uh, you're welcome to participate in any of our upcoming partner workshops as well. We'd love to see you um, there. Or feel free to pass those on to your colleagues. Um, and like I said, you're welcome to use me um, as your resource. I'm happy to help however I can. Um, so I've shared my email address here. I will follow up with a recording from today's session as well as um, the slide decks. So you have those resources to come back to. Um, and if you do have any questions, you can always reply there. Um, it looks like we're right at the hour. So um, I, um, I can... And I'll wrap things up and I, I hope you all have a, a great rest of your day. And Becky, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, I think everyone on the call, we've learned a lot. Um, so we do appreciate your time and your You're help welcome. with this. Yeah, it's always always great working with uh, UBC faculty. So I'm excited to be working with you all today and excited to see how you, know, you all start using groups. Feel free to share any of those ideas. You're like, hey, Becky, this really worked, this didn't work. I'm always happy to brainstorm uh, with you. So um, like I said, enjoy the rest of your day and um, I look forward to hearing from you. Bye.